All right, so welcome. Um, my name is Rebecca Leopoldina Torres, and I'm currently serving as the president of the Monotype Guild of New England. And I'll be serving as the moderator for the Q&A later on. On behalf of the Guild, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight for our Valentine's Day themed talk on the history of the colors red and pink with conservation coordinator, Allison Karens from the Strauss Center of Conservation, home of the world renowned Forbes Pigment Collection, which has been featured recently on NPR, the Boston Globe and the New York Times. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the indigenous cultures of New England. As the Monotype Guild of New England is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we join you from the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people in the Wampanoag tribe. I would like to recognize them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. This land is a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. And so in that tradition, we look forward to our meeting and exchange with you all tonight. We have artists and color enthusiasts joining us from all over the US and beyond today. So whether you are joining us in our webinar format, via our live stream on YouTube or watching this recording at a later date, we are grateful for you and happy that you're here with us tonight. If you haven't done so already, please read, really, Please feel free to drop a note in the Q&A or in the comments to let us know where you're joining us from. From those of you not familiar with the Monotype Guild of New England, we are a volunteer run nonprofit printmaking organization consisting of over 250 contemporary artists creating unique impressions by working the mediums of monotype and monoprints. We are our volunteer run artist organization. So we're currently funded primarily by our membership dues and donations. So I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank all of our members and volunteers who are helping to keep this organization not only running, but growing and thriving during these unprecedented times. While our current exhibitions are on hold for the time being, we have a wide range of upcoming virtual events, including artist talks, meetups, studio tours, demos, um, and much more in the works. So please feel free to go to our website at mgne.org for more information. So just a few points of logistics. Uh, we are using the webinar format primarily in Zoom, so we invite you to submit, submit your brief questions via the Q&A box, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. And if you're joining via our YouTube live stream, feel free to drop your questions in the comments. Uh, the presentation will last approximately 45 minutes and we'll devote the last 10 minutes or so to questions. So feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation and we'll hold them until the end. Live captioning is available via the Zoom webinar, so we will drop instructions in how to access this in the chat. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's get on with the program. Uh, like all of you, I'm excited to get a behind the scenes peek into this historic collection of pigments. This is a special treat, as the general public usually don't have the opportunity to see these pigments up close. As the collection is kept socially distanced behind glass and is actively used by the conservation scientists at the Harvard Art Museums, who rely on the samples for testing and as a reference material in an analytic, uh, analytical laboratory. In full disclosure, in addition to my role supporting the Monotype Guild, I also work on staff at the Harvard Art Museums where I quickly became fascinated with this collection and the captivating history and science of color itself. Most of the, one of the uh, biggest highlights of my career has been working with Allison and the brilliant Massachusetts-based photographer, Caitlin Cunningham, in, in 2019 as a creative director of a week-long photo shoot of the Forbes Pigment Collection, Geddon's collection of binding media and varnishes, and the Strauss collection of historic scientific instruments relating to the technical study of art for the museum. It has been extremely exciting to see how the stunning imagery from this project has been used to tell the stories behind these materials and objects, including the stories that will be shared with you all tonight. So now I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Allison Karens. Allison is the conservation coordinator in the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies at the Harvard Art Museums, and is also one of the voices from the popular audio tour of the Forbes Pigment Collection. A major aspect of her position involves working closely with the Pigment Collection, assisting with new additions, cataloging the collection, and managing access, media requests, and tours. Allison received her bachelor's degree in art history from the University of New Hampshire with minors in business administration and Italian studies. While her love of art and museums was apparent from a very young age, it was not until she began working with the Forbes Pigment Collection that she discovered a true passion for the building blocks of art, pigments and artistic uh, artist materials. So thank you, Allison, for sharing that passion with us tonight. And with that, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to you. Thank you, Becca. 
I would also like to say that one of the highlights of my career has been working with you on the photo shoot we did with Caitlin. So I will start with Valentine's Day at the Forest Pigment Collection. I am gonna begin with giving you a little bit of context for what the pigment collection is and why it exists. Um, Edward Waldo Forbes was born in 1873 into two prestigious families as the grandson of Jonathan Murray Forbes, a railroad magnet and co-founder of the Bell Telephone Company. He was also the grandson of the lauded poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was educated at, oh, my apologies. I moved ahead a bit too quickly. Uh, so he was educated at Milton Academy as well as Harvard University. And it was following his education at Harvard that he traveled to Europe to study art history, specifically Italian paintings. He then returned to the United States and held a series of lecturing positions at his alma maters in high school and college. He then became the first, one of the earliest directors of the Contemporary Fog Museum, which was founded in 18... My apologies. Sorry. Uh, I believe the initial Fog Museum was founded in 1873. Um, so 13 years following its initial founding, uh, Forbes became one of the earliest directors of the Fog Museum and it grew exponentially under his tenure. This included the construction of a new building which is where the Harvard Art Museums are currently housed and what is known as the Fog Building colloquially today. It also included massive fundraising campaigns and the vast expansion of the art collection. Uh, much of the early Fog collection was comprised of study copies and plaster casts. This was very typical for art museums and art collections at the time in the late 19th, early 20th century in the United States. And Forbes desired to create a collection of original works of art to allow students to experience and look closely at works by original masters. Uh, in this endeavor, Forbes in often encountered works for auction in Europe that were either inexpertly restored or in incredibly poor condition or both. He quickly realized that a, in order to properly preserve and care for these treasures, he needed to have a deep understanding of the materials and processes by which they were made. He described this period of his life as, I somehow stumbled upon my very special field. And so in addition to collecting original works of art, Forbes also began collecting samples of the various materials that were used in the creation of art, notably pigments, which are the components of art that add color. Forbes believed adamantly that close looking for students and scientists was the only way to truly learn about art. This message still dictates the Harvard Art Museum's mission statement today, which is based in teaching and close looking in the classroom. Uh, in this period of time, Forbes began teaching what we would become known as his signature methods and processes of Italian painting, 
This was known colloquially as the egg and plaster class. Um, around this period of time, oh, you can see here Forbes teaching his egg and plaster class, which was focused on art history students learning firsthand the experiences by which you create a painting. So at this point, Forbes hired the chemist, John Rutherford Gettens, essentially founding the Department of Technical Research at the Fog Art Museum in 1928. That department has been consistently in existence from 1928 till now, and is now known as the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies, where I work and where the Forbes Pigment Collection is housed. Shortly thereafter, Forbes hired the art historian George Stout as the Fogg's first conservator. Together, Stout and Gettens pioneered three major areas of art conservation, which are rudiments, degradation, and reparations. This uh, distinguishing of the care for art and the assessment of art effectively brought art conservation into the world of modern science. It was the first area, rudiments, that Forbes's massive collection of pigments found their home and their true purpose. Through technical analysis, Gettens was able to use these pigments to develop technical standards as well as study the way materials behaved in specific conditions. While it is undoubtedly beautiful and an incredible testament to art making throughout history, the primary function of the Forbes Pigment Collection today is still a set of analytical standards as they were used by Gettens. We still actually have a cabinet called the Gettens Cabinet in the Strauss Center, which includes samples that Gettens himself created of pigments and various media exposed to certain conditions, such as high heat, high humidity, fire. And now, oh, oh my goodness, I apologize. So, and now we will move on to a deep dive into a few of the pigments in the Forbes Pigment Collection. Uh, no Valentine's Day discussion would be complete without, of course, discussing the color pink. Uh, this is by far one of the most difficult pigment groups to discuss uh, as it is absolutely the most controversial pigment scientifically and culturally. Um, it is the only pigment that scientists debate whether or not it scientifically exists. On the visible light spectrum, which you can see at the top of the slide here, all colors visible to the human eye appear as their own distinct wavelength. Pink, as it is conceived, is the only extra spectral color, meaning it does not have its own distinct wavelength and does not appear anywhere on this visible light spectrum. It is actually the combination of strong red, moderate violet, and weak green wavelengths. These are taken in by the human eye and mixed and interpreted by our brains to create the color pink, which scientifically is often known as red violet. However, other scientists have countered that our eyes do not only perceive color as subtractive, which is the visible light spectrum you see at the top of the page. And this is essentially the idea that a red apple absorbs all wavelengths of color with the exception of, say, the 
460 wavelength and reflects back only that one wavelength, which allows our eyes to only see that 460. However, our eyes are undoubtedly capable of perceiving color as additive, which you can see in the bottom right, where there is a violet blue piece of cloth that if you zoom in is created by Bendy dots. And those are simply red and simply blue, but we conceive of them as a purplish, very cool blue or a violet. And so if you think, if you realize that our eyes perceive color as additive as much as subtractive, then pink belongs as a color as much as any other color. This is where color theory really comes into play, where colors can look very different when they're placed closely to others. Another great example in the support of colors and being perceived differently and in an additive way, as well as the existence of pink is the fact that colors are inarguably perceived differently by different people, depending on very different factors, including the time period in their life, as well as their sex, as well as any different number of hormones in their brain. So it has been proven scientifically, for example, that teenagers perceive violet as a much more intense hue than adult brains do. So the wavelengths of violet, while they have their own distinct wavelength, are inherently perceived by our brain differently depending on our point in time in life, depending on the hormones in our age. So in that regard, pink does exist just as much as any other color. The other area where pink is an elusive and complex color and concept is in the actual use of pigment and naming the color. It has proven so complex that in the 17th century, the Chinese word for pigment meant alien and internal, which I think really captures how pink exists outside of our concept of color and is very much perceived within ourselves. Uh, in the Western world, it was only around this same time during the Renaissance that pink began being discussed as its own color on a palette. Uh, it was first given the moniker we know of in the 17th century. While the word pink existed undoubtedly before the 17th century, it applied to shades of a much wider variety than we think of today. Many of the samples in the forest pigment collection named pink are actually a yellowish shade. And those are made from buckthorn berries, also known as Persian berries. And these are a lake pigment that are distinctly yellow. And here we have English pink, Dutch pink, and Italian pink, all of which appear distinctly yellow, as you can see. And it wasn't until the late 17th century that pink began to apply exclusively to the red-violet hue we think of today. In addition to being scientifically and culturally complex and contested, pink is without a doubt the most socially complex color. Uh, within the three centuries since it appeared as its own autonomous color, it has swung in meaning across cultures from symbolizing masculinity to mourning to lushness, to sexuality, to femininity, to innocence. Um, and in the 20th century alone, pink has undergone several overhauls in rapid succession. 
initially being associated with infant boys to now being associated with infant girls to then being reclaimed as an active and dynamic, powerful part of political spheres. The social context of pink, especially in regards to protest and counterculture is incredibly complex and beautiful, but is far too complex to dive into now. However, it is clear that pink has become to so inherently bold and indicative of dissent that it was the go-to color chosen by Stuart Semple in his pigment-driven protest against the de-democratization of the art world, where the artist Anish Kapoor purchased the rights to the use of the newly formed pigment, uh, carbon nanotube light effect pigment, Vanta Black, immediately upon its conception, Stuart Semple, as well as other artists, felt that this was completely counter to the idea of art being something that can be created by anyone. And so Stuart created, in protest, the pinkest pink, effectively starting the modern day color wars where anyone besides Anish Kapoor could purchase it. And it was available for purchase on his website, uh, but you had to attest via a contract that you were not affiliated with Anish Kapoor and would not share the pigment with him. And then Anish Kapoor managed to purchase or somehow come into contact with a bottle of Pink is Pink and then posted a picture of his middle finger dipped in the pigment, essentially causing the modern pigment controversy. Uh, I really love that story because it's exciting and funny and fascinating, but it also really shows how the pigment collection and understanding of pigment and artist materials can show people the experience of humanity throughout time and can really illuminate so much of the world that artists were living in at the time that they created their artwork. Moving on to red, the other component of Valentine's Day. Uh, so if one were to declare any color or pigment the oldest, the award would certainly have to go to the color red. Throughout culture, throughout time, cultures have assigned names to colors in a relatively fixed order. This phenomenon is known as the hierarchy of color. The origin of this hierarchy is largely unexplained in human nature, but it is thought to be closely related to how human brains react to the visible light spectrum and the emotional intensity with which we respond to certain colors. What is unequivocally clear is that the color red consistently lies at the very top of this hierarchy and has been named in cultures consistently since the beginning of human existence. Evidence of this essential draw to the color red are our collection of red ochres, which are some of the very first pigments used to create art. While the term ochre today conjures images of an earthy yellow, much of the earliest ochre pigments were a rich red which is comprised of clay naturally colored with hematite. And red ochre can form throughout the world in various conditions, anywhere that iron is rich and can pool. There's evidence that ochre has been used to stain, paint, and draw from as long as 285,000 years ago. 
and from the caves of Lascaux in modern day France to Juliary Rock in Aus modern day Australia. There are literally thousands of Paleolithic era paintings throughout the world that have almost always feature red ochre. There's also evidence that early humans traveled hundreds of miles to gather red ochre for use in art or personal body painting, which serves as a real testament to how essential the creation of art and beauty was even during a time where they were fighting for their very survival. Next, we have vermilion, um, which is one of the most widely known reds. Vermilion is the synthetic analog of a toxic ore called cinnabar, which is a mercury sulfide. It was used starting as much as 2,500 years ago. It originated in China. It was very popular as a paint, but was also very popular as a cosmetic and was used to color lips, cheeks, as well as to create the bindis of South Asian culture. It was popular amongst painters worldwide from the Renaissance to the 20th century. Uh, its greatest flaw outside of its toxicity is its tendency to darken over time. This is one of the greatest mysteries in the pigment and art creation world in that it is still not fully un understood why vermilion or cinnabar darkens over time. What is known is that UV exposure is absolutely a factor However, the exact reasoning or exposure level that causes this reaction is still very unknown. The bottle that you see being held by our director, Narayan Kandekar, in, uh, on the left of the slide is a really fantastic example of this in that the pigment at the front of the bottle has darkened over time. But because we do not disturb the pigments regularly and we only take microscopic samples, there is a virgin sample of that exact same pigment encased within the bottle. So that's a really fantastic illustration of why the Forbes Pigment Collection is so critical in that within that one bottle, we have samples of the pigment throughout its various states of being. Next, we have Kermes lice. The word crimson comes from the word Kermes and the color crimson is created from bugs which makes this the etymological and entomological root of the word crimson. Crimson is created from the dried bodies of female Kermes insects, which are rich in carminic acid, which is a deep red lake pigment. They can be gathered from the Kermes oak in the Mediterranean regions of Europe. Uh, from about March to June of each year. From the ancient Greeks through the Middle Ages, this was the primary source of deep red pigment in Europe. However, it was quickly usurped when Spanish conquistadors returned with cochineal. Much like Kermes, this pigment is derived from the bodies of scaled insects containing high levels of carminic acid. However, it's produced a much stronger and much more light fast dye. And these insects are also significantly more plentiful than Kermes lice as they breed year round and can be found in any desert environment and they quickly became the dominant crimson red in Europe. Before this, cochineal had been used widely in the 
continent, which is now known as South America. It was utilized by the Maya and Aztec peoples from as early as the second century BC. Cochineal is a unique pigment furthermore in that it is one of our only pigments that is still used widely today in its original form. It is one of the only pigments that the original format is cheaper, safer, and easier to mass produce versus a modern synthetic version of itself. Other than the food, textile, and cosmetics industry, it is also still used in traditional cultures throughout South America. A really great example of this is the Zapotec weaving of Oaxaca, Mexico, where the top two slide, the top two images of this slide are samples we were given from traditional Zapotec weavers. The Gutierrez family, we were given them by Porfirio Gutierrez. And sorry. Um, so, yes, it's used <laughs> thoroughly today. And then we move on to Dragon's Blood which is by far the most commented upon by visitors as it has such an arresting and evocative name. Ancient lore holds that this resinous color is from the coagulated blood shed by dragons during mortal combat with elephants. Unfortunately, it comes from a notably less romantic and grand source which is various species of rattan palms. Oh. I apologize. Dragon's blood has been used widely since medieval times. For a, a period of time, it was the primary lake pigment for uh, manuscript illumination. However, it was written about in a similarly romantic way as it was named, often being called in poetry and writing a fickle mistress that could not be trusted, which was essentially to convey that it was a fugitive pigment which meant that it would quickly degrade upon exposure to oxygen and light. And you can see that here in that much of our pigment samples have quickly turned to an earthy reddish brown, whereas in its original form, it is a deep blood red. Next, we have matter. The jar of matter seen on the upper left was actually grown in the 1920s by Forbes himself in his garden at Jerry's Landing in Cambridge. This really illustrates Forbes's commitment to the growth of his collection in that he would ask anyone he knew to ferret out samples of original material. And if he couldn't find them, he would grow them or make them himself. Matter root has been used consistently to create lake pigment known as rose matter or matter lake. A lake pigment is a pigment that is created when what is known as a dye is precipitated onto an inert mordant, which is usually a metallic salt. This allows the pigment particles to fuse with solid molecules, transforming a liquid dye into a solid powder pigment. This process, which sounds incredibly modern, actually dates back to antiquity and was practiced widely with matter, as well as other pigments as far back as the ancient Egyptians. 
Next, we have one of our modern synthetics, PR254, which stands for pigment red 254, which is emblematic of the way that modern synthetic pigments are named. A yellow would be named PY, the number it came in succession. This tiny vial is one of a group of modern synthetic pigments that were donated to the Harvard Art Museums by the Tate in 2012. While the pigment collection has been in existence and grown since its creation, there was a distinctly quiet period following World War II as George Stout left to become one of the monuments men, which were immortalized in the movie. His character was played by George Clooney. And there was a distinct period of preserving and caring for art and collecting and researching for the sake of it had a very dormant period. But this group of pigments from the Tate really served as a launching pad for us to begin collecting contemporary pigments in earnest for the Ford's pigment collection. Additionally, this particular red pigment played a significant role in one of the most fantastic projects that really demonstrate the significance of the Ford's pigment collection. And that was undertaken in 2009 in 2002, the son of a former acquaintance of Jackson Pollock found paintings in family storage that were signed and noted in a way that appeared to be that they were made by Jackson Pollock. Many believed based on provenance as well as connoisseurship that these were authentic paintings. However, using various forms of technical analysis available to us, including FTIR, GCMS, and X-ray spectrometry, as well as Raman spectrometry, it was established that these paintings could not possibly have been authentic. PR254, which was marketed as Ferrari Red, was one of the few critical pieces of evidence in that paint, including this pigment, was not available until at least 10 years after Pollock's death, and that it was interspersed within the paintings in a way that showed that it could not possibly have been a later edition. Our final red for today will be Lithol Red. Variations of this modern synthetic pigment have been favored by many modern artists, but was especially beloved by Mark Rothko in his color field paintings. The deep study of this pigment is the root of one of the Strauss Center's most revolutionary projects. The penthouse dining hall of the Holyoke Center, originally when it was built, included special uh, special I'm sorry special works commissioned by Mark Rothko that were site specific. However, due to the large amount of windows as well as the high exposure to human interaction, these paintings quickly became far too faded and damaged to be on display. They were then put into storage. However, and you can see at the bottom right, them in their original installation in the Holyoke Dining Center in 1964. When the Harvard Art Museums reopened in 2015, we wanted to redisplay these incredible works of art. However, due to the nature of color field paintings, incredibly large areas of the painting were deeply damaged by UV light. 
And so restoring them using traditional conservation methods would have essentially involved repainting the painting. So a unique endeavor was undertaken to both understand what the painting would have originally looked like, as well as creating a trick to the human eye to make it look that way. So using technical analysis, our department discovered that lithol red with calcium salt, as you see in the upper left corner, the leftmost bottle, and lithium red using sodium salts, which is the right bottle in the upper left, were used to create the original artwork. Using fadeometry testing, it was established that Lithol red using sodium salts faded notably less quickly than lithol red using calcium salts. And we're able to develop a mock-up of what the painting would have originally appeared as. And that you can see is figure one. Figure two is the painting deeply faded, as you can see, then a specific computer program was developed to particle by particle reflect light that when perceived by the human eye, which ties back to our conception of pink earlier, um, would effectively look to us like the painting was restored. Uh, at the bottom left, you can see our director, Narayan Kandakar, holding a white poster board in front of the painting. But what you see here is the projected light using the computer program. When he removes the poster board, you can see figure four, which is the painting as it would have originally appeared. And that is how it appeared in the galleries when the projectors were turned on. Effectively restoring the painting for the viewer temporarily without doing any sort of invasive intervention on the painting itself. And that is our tour of the distinct reds and pinks of the Forbes Pigment Collection. Um, I hope you enjoyed the tour. I'd be happy to answer a few questions now. Here are... Thank you so much, Allison. Um, if you could go back to the slide with Rothko, there was a, a question about, can you, what's the name of the red pigment that you were discussing? Lithol red. Perfect. The technical name of it is PR49. Awesome. Um, and we do have lots of, uh, Allison provided lots of links to lots of articles There's, uh, for all the different fascinating things you talked about tonight. So we dropped some of the links in the chat, including a link to download. Um, and we'll also send that out via email to everybody who joined tonight. Um, we have lots of great questions. So the first is, um, the someone asked about the um, recent New York Times article that uh, announced the new color blue and they were asking if that is in the Forest Pigment Collection. Oh yeah, you and I actually talked about that yesterday, which is great. Um, yes, so that is known as Yinmin blue. We actually have had a sample of that for about four years now. Um, while it has just been announced as a new blue pigment in paint, it was an, announced within the science and art and conservation community as a newly discovered pigment about four years ago. And so fortunately for us, we are able to get in touch with Moss Supermanian, who was the original creator accidentally of the new blue pigment. And he sent us a sample almost immediately. We are also very fortunate in that we have contacts at the paint company Devlin in that 
as they developed prototypes for paint using that pigment, they sent us various samples. Awesome. Yeah, it's exciting because you're talking about how there's new uh, pigments that are now being discovered. You kind of talked about that with the pink is pink and Vanta Black, but um, it's exciting. Yeah, well, a lot of cool. the newest pigments are actually being developed in Massachusetts, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, there was some questions about uh, the toxicity of these pigments. Um, specifically around vermilion, um, why is it toxic, especially if it was used for makeup? And maybe you want to talk a little bit about the history of toxic pigments. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of different pigments are incredibly toxic. One of the higher up on the list is definitely vermilion. It was used in cosmetics despite its toxicity, I think possibly because people weren't totally aware of its toxicity, but also maybe despite its toxicity for the sake of beauty, there is scholarly evidence that people were aware of the toxicity of both cinnabar which is vermilion, as well as lead white, long before it fell out of favor in cosmetics. And that was simply because there was nothing comparable in beauty. Um, vermilion in particular is toxic in that it is a mercury sulfide. And so it contains mercury which is in such fine particles that it can be absorbed through the skin. And so certainly should not be touched. And as a powder pigment can be incidentally inhaled in small volumes, which allows it into your lungs and directly into your bloodstream, which causes heavy metal poisoning. Uh, mercury specifically has been associated, mercury and arsenic have been associated with what's now known as Mad Hatter's disease, which was the mental malady associated with many hatters who created taxidermy and felting to create hats, especially in the Victorian era. And a huge part of this was often mercury. And this was also associated with watchmaking. And so for metal plating, they used mercury. For taxidermy and preservation of felting, they used mercury and arsenic. And those would lead to heavy metal poisoning, which caused degradation in the brain and would cause, a, a, for lack of a better term, a Swiss cheese effect, similar to advanced syphilis, um, as well as the kidney and liver effects that go along with any heavy metal poisoning. So that is why we don't use vermilion. Right. <laughs> on our faces. That's right. And I, I think this ties into, I mean, this is one of my, um, well, probably one of the most asked questions I get is around emerald green and our Van Gogh portrait and how toxic that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but someone asked, um, were painters aware at the time that this, these uh, materials were extremely toxic when they were using them? Overwhelmingly, the answer is actually yes. Um, certainly lead white, ha people have been aware, maybe not distinctly scientifically quantitatively, but they have been colloquially aware of the effects, the negative effects of lead white and vermilion, as well as arsine compounds on the human well-being. There is even a rumor that the British put Napoleon into a room with emerald green, shields green wallpaper 
specifically to degradate his lungs because they were aware that wallpaper with these compounds was toxic. However, despite that, it was still used on confectionaries and in makeup and in clothing and in wallpaper. There is a distinct dichotomy there in that often women would use lead white to lighten their faces, which would cause lesions, and they would use more lead white to cover up those lesions. So there is a really distinct trend in human history of sacrificing your own health at the altar of aesthetics. That's great. Um, there's a, few, a question, a couple of questions about the cochineal. Um, I don't know if you want to go back to that slide. Um, and someone was asking how small uh, the insects are, because it's hard to tell, I guess, from the slide. Oh, yes. Let me get back to that. Oh, sorry, I went too far. They are similar in size. Okay, so here are the Kermes and the Cochineal. Um, so I would say that each insect is about three millimeters in length at most, one to three millimeters. Great, and, and how are they uh, harvested? So they, I don't, I don't know how many like plant owners we have here, but there are often like soft scaled insects that will breed in the crevices of a lot of plants and that is what cochineal are. And they are attracted to moist plants in a desert environment. And so they are particularly found on cacti within any sort of crevasse within the cacti. And they create a colony that almost looks slightly white and fuzzy, uh, but that's actually just because of the like deep, the intense population of them, the high population in that they create what looks almost like a fungus, but it's actually a, a densely populated group of cochineal. And similar to the tiny red bugs you see crawling on concrete, if you squish them, they look blood red. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the artists were asking, they said that um, they know that when they're used to dye on wool, they're usually, they start off pink. And so she's wondering if there's like a hue, um, if it's if, if just to like a redder color based on the species or it's, it's just how the techniques that are used. Um, I think it's technique as well as density, uh, the amount of insects you're using versus the amount of carrier liquid you're using. Uh, I do think that the mordant would also be a really big factor there. Uh, so the mordant is essentially, it's not glue, but it's the chemical compound that allows the pigment to adhere to a surface when a lake pigment is in its liquid form. And a lot of people use vinegar. Ammonia is also a really great mordant, which is why ancient Romans used urine to dye fabrics. And I do think that depending on the mordant you use, you would get a different density of color on a dyed fabric. Yeah, but I am also not a dyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we have some people in the in, who are joining us tonight who use with work with textiles. Um, mm -hmm. So I love to hear their thoughts. Um, yeah, which is amazing, and it's actually a very niche and specialized field. We textiles are an especially elusive area, especially 
like how the pigments adhere, the different mordants. It's a very distinct alchemy. And it's actually a specialty that is not taught in most of the conservation programs mm -hmm. in North America. And so it's very specialized. Um, there is, there's so many questions, we're probably not gonna get to all of them. Um, there's a question about uh, what are the pigments I get asked about the most in, in the collection? Um, I definitely get asked about the toxic pigments, like we already talked about the lead white, the vermilion, the emerald green. People also just generally want to know what are, what are the most toxic pigments we have. Um, there's also orpiment, which is a between, it could be anywhere from red to yellow to orange. Um, I also often get asked about Egyptian blue, which is a very rare pigment in that it was the first synthetic blue before we realized <laughs> that they'd already made a synthetic blue. Um, the Egyptians had actually learned to synthesize a blue pigment long before 1826, which was our first modern synthetic blue pigment. Uh, however, the technology and all awareness of the existence of that pigment disappeared with their culture. And it was undiscovered until ruins of Pompeii in ancient Egypt were dug up. Oh, I definitely get asked the most about Indian yellow, I would say because that's the one made of pee. <laughs> um, so Indian yellow is created from the urine of cows that have been severely dehydrated and fed only mango leaves. And then the urine is collected and boiled until it is in a dehydrated state, at which point it is gathered into loose linen cloth and balled to create something called a puri. The origins, the actual origins of Indian yellow are hotly contested, uh, but we have actually one of fewer than a dozen authentic original puris in our collection. And a recent study found that there are Enzymes distinct to both the mango plant as well as ruminant animals present, mm -hmm. which would align with that original theory. That's, that's cool. Um, there's a lot of comments about pink. People didn't realize that it's a cerebral color. Um, and someone was asking your thoughts on pink being used as, as calming especially um, around autistic children. Hmm. Yeah, I, to be honest, I am not having a notable background in psychiatry. I can't speak too much to the idea of pink as and its effect on the human brain. But I do know that there was a distinct period of time, both in Western culture and Eastern cultures in China and Japan, that pink was associated with the internality of mourning and that quiet internal experience. And I do think that perhaps the fact that pink is a color that by its very existence forces our brain to focus in on itself is possibly something that could be really useful to someone's brain that is perhaps overly active and needs something to focus in on. Um, so it's seven o'clock, but um, I just wanted to ask you one last question, which is how can people learn more about the pigment color? 
pigments in general? Mm -hmm. Uh, so there are a lot of great books, um, one of which is The Atlas of Color by Victoria Finley, who worked with our director, Ryan Kandekar, to create a fantastic uh, anthology of pigments and their backgrounds. There is another book called The Secret Lives of Color, which in delves really deeply into the background and all the little stories that go into pigments and gives you a really good picture of how understanding the background of pigments can really illuminate the understanding of human history. Um, those are my two favorites. Uh, there are also articles kind of all over the place. Um, well, and we should plug your audio tour. So, um, oh yeah, go to our audio tour. Yeah, you should check out the audio tour at the harvardartmuseums.org um, that gives a more highlighted, up close look at a lot of the pigments in the collection. So, um, and correlations to some of the work in the museum as well. Um, and like I said, we'll be sending links out. So we definitely encourage people to check it out. Well, thank you so much, Allison, for yeah, this lovely talk, for, for dropping some fascinating knowledge about uh, the history of pinks and reds. And uh, I just wanted to wish you and everyone a happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. You too. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. So we just want to wish everybody a good night and hopefully we'll see you soon for another talk about Maybe the uh, something else involving pigments in the Gettings collection. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, everyone have a good night.